Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Blue Economy Symposium. My name is Melanie Rafnian. I'm um, the chair of Sherwood Valley Band of Pomo Indians, which is a tribe located in Willits. I originated here. Oh, well, actually, I moved here when we were seven, and I've lived here up until I moved over there. Um, I'm a descendant. Uh, my family has lived here forever, that I can remember anyway. They used to live down in the harbor in by the jetty area. Um, ooh, touching things. Um, um, I would like to offer a, a small blessing today. <clears throat> so you can stand or not, it's up to you. It, it's not, it's not a, a, a formal blessing, it's just something I'd like to say. Please help us to have an open mind, allow us to share our knowledge, learn from each other and build relationships through collaborations. Please help us to grow and develop our community to provide much needed stability for our economy. Kadiwa Dem, walk well. Jessica? All right, thank you so much for that. All right, hello and welcome. My name is Jessica Morsell Hay and I'm the Vice Mayor of Fort Bragg. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you here today. Thank you so much for making the journey to our city. Uh, we know it's an interesting one um, and we're, we couldn't be happier to be here um, engaging in this discussion with you about a blue industry hub in Fort Bragg. A quick reminder, there are a lot of electeds in the room, so let's be mindful of the Brown Act as we proceed. Um, before we jump right into the nuts and bolts of our conversation, I'd love to share a little personal context. I grew up on the Mendocino coast, and while I was away at college, Fort Bragg's lumber mill was shut down and dismantled. I moved back to the coast in 2015 to raise my own family here. Driving down the streets, I'd, see, I'd been on a thousand times, I'd be struck by the unexpected view corridors to the ocean. There were beautiful open expanses where lumber stacks and buildings had stood for over a century. In these new expanses, I see huge foundational change and opportunity for our community. As a rural community, we're rich in nature, resilience, and practical skill sets, but our traditional systems for leveraging these livelihoods, or for, sorry, for leveraging these into livelihoods have been disappearing. Making ends meet is no longer guaranteed here. At a population of about 7,300 people, Fort Bragg is small enough that we should be able to identify our shared needs. And, sorry, <laughs> I lost it. Um, we, that we should be able to identify our shared needs and work to address them. These same shared needs extend out into the broader region for which our city, for which our city is an important economic hub. This is not a space for partisan politics, but a space for practical problem solving. So here we've gathered now in a city on the edge of the Pacific Ocean at a time when foundational change is all around us. This isn't only change in the balance of this local economy, but in the larger environmental and economic systems around us. These global foundational shifts require that we ask new questions as we strategize for the future. How do we diversify industry while positioning a rural community for resilience through intensifying climate events? How do we build infrastructure to enable innovation, restoration, and adaptability while leveraging existing skill sets within our community? With its rich history in commercial fishing, seafood processing, shipbuilding, recreation, and tourism, Fort Bragg has, in its own way, always engaged in a blue economy. New opportunities, however, are emerging in response to climate impacts and techn technological innovation. By building upon our strengths and working together to make necessary infrastructure improvements, develop workforce education programs, support and attract entrepreneurs, we can improve the quality of life for our community, keep this waterfront working, and nurture healthy marine ecosystems all at the same time. Over the next two days of this symposium, we will hear from experts on components of the blue economy, including municipal marine water infrastructure, local fisheries, conservation aquaculture, and much more. 
The participation of our community, our electeds, our regulators, regional partners, and neighboring regions is all critical as we build this vision together. So as we do so, let's each take responsibility and accountability for finding collaborative solutions. I'd like to acknowledge Sarah McCormick for her incredible work in bringing our regional partners together around this vision. Thank you for your vision. Yeah. <laughs> so Sarah, thank you for your vision and collaborative spirit as you've laid the groundwork for this symposium. Our first speaker today is Paula Sylvia, who traveled from San Diego to join us. Paula, mm -hmm. <laughs> Paula is the Port of San Diego's Aquaculture and Blue Technology Program Director. Established in 2015, the Port of San Diego's Aquaculture and Blue Technology Program not only conducts planning and pre-development work to support and inform aquaculture and blue technology opportunities, in and around San Diego Bay, but also fosters a blue economy incubator to assist in the creation, development, and scaling of new water-dependent business ventures, focusing on sustainable aquaculture and port-related blue technologies. Thank you, Paula, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica, Melanie. Definitely, yeah, thanks, and thank you. So okay, thank you. And thank you, Sarah. I agree. Like, thank you for your leadership and bringing this all together. Um, I'm representing the Port of San Diego today. My uh, two of my leadership was unable to come at the last minute due to COVID madness, but I'm happy to be here. I'll do my best to represent them in the port. Um, but yeah, I was here last year. I think it was last year at this time when we did a virtual I don't know how big the audience was at the time because I wasn't here physically, but it was really a pleasure to be part of that and all the ongoing conversations that we've had in the last year. And this, you've done an incredible job, everybody. So thank you so much. I will do my best. So I'm here to just talk about <clears throat> Uh, the greater blue economy in the beginning, right? So these are some new numbers that just came in um, from a report that TMA Blue Tech did, which is a local organization in San Diego about uh, our uh, region, California, and then our region's blue economy. So but, and back in 2016, it was well recognized um, by a, a nationwide, or sorry, a global report that Blue economy was predicted to grow from 1.5 trillion in 2010 to 3 trillion by 2030. And I just can't believe that we're almost there, right? So there's lots of opportunity, right? But then this new report that just came out, it was an update from a 2012 report talking about in California, well, US alone has generated, the ocean economy has generated, you know, nearly 700 billion in sales. 400 billion in GDP and employed over 2.4 million employees. And uh, bringing it home to California, this is, you know, 16.2 billion of economic impact in maritime water and blue tech in the San Diego region, but that's contri contributed to $43.4 billion in uh, economic impact to the state of California and a little bit lower to um, basically to our San Diego region. So, uh, and then during COVID, uh, and actually in the last 10 years since the previous report, businesses, blue tech and maritime businesses have increased their revenues by eight, I think 18% and basically increased jobs by 163%. And that's including during COVID time. So it's just a representative of how much opportunity is in this space and um, what a unique role that all of us in this room and many others have to play. So I'll just, um, lead in with just talking about the unique role of ports, right? So very much what Jessica said, you know, is the same at, at the Port of San Diego and, and many other ports. So we have this expertise uh, in the blue economy that's been around a long time, right? So permitting and entitlements expertise, we're often wear many hats, you know, landlords, regulators, environmental stewards. In many cases, we've been supporting the blue economy for decades um, and it's just now time to diversify uh, into different sectors and then we're very good at supporting public public and public private partnerships 
So that's no different. That's globally and nationally and regionally in California. But when you bring it down to the port of San Diego, we're the fourth largest port in the state of California. And we are very similar in status to Humboldt Bay Harbor District, which, which many of you are uh, either representing or familiar with here. So we're considered a special district that was granted a certain amount of tide lands from, which is land and water rights from the California State Lands Commission as part of special legislator back in the 60s. So currently we uh, manage over 14,000 acres of land and water rights. Uh, two years ago in 2020, the dark blue area, which is, um, mostly the middle of the bay that was granted to us that is an additional 8300 acres that was granted to us by state lands commission back in 2020 um, per state senate bill um, 507 so we're working on incorporating that uh, piece those that property into our port master plan update which will support aquaculture and blue tech as, as well as many other businesses so and like Building on what, you, what you've all said, you know, the port's been in the blue economy for a long time, right? We have vibrant commercial and recreational fisheries that we support. We've got cargo and cruise lines, traditional shipbuilding and boat yards, lots of different coastal development, especially in our area. We're very big and mixed use bay, but we're looking at different things, right? So branching out, looking at new businesses and new opportunities to diversify our economic base, especially you know, in, in the in the face of just, you know, not just climate change, but so many other things, right? COVID taught us a lot about like needing to diversify our, our business base. So that's what I'm here to talk about is one of the new programs that the port created, which was an aquaculture and blue technology program, but we do a lot of other stuff, right? So my, my program is just one piece that's focusing on advancing aquaculture and blue tech, new blue tech things but we actually have a lot of plans and policies at the port that support everything from sea level rise to ocean planning, natural resources, our general port master plan that tells us what we can and can't do in and around the Bay. That's being updated for the first time in 50 years. It's been an eight year process um, and it's in its final year. It's hopefully gonna come out this summer sometime, but as one example, aquaculture and blue tech were not previously considered as land or water uses in our port master plan, but they will be this time, right? So that's just one example. There are many, but um, just to give you an idea of like what drives us. So once that happens and it gets passes through Coastal Commission, we'll be putting ourselves in a better place to support new businesses. And then of course we have our climate action plan and a maritime clean air strategy that just came out at the end of last year to help support some of our climate goals. So we'll just talk very quickly about what we're doing in the climate and coastal resiliency space, because that's, you know, a big part of the blue economy, right? So we've got a three-pronged approach to our climate action platform, you know, mitigation, sequestration, and adaptation. We've got our guiding documents for emissions reduction, which are come in our California, uh, the climate action plan that we adopted in 2013. We were one of the first ports to do that. And then one of the first, this maritime clean air strategy is super aggressive and trying to help us meet our, you know, emissions reduction goals. So this is a really busy slide, but it's just, just to show you that we've secured now over 26 million from different programs, stimulus included, to actually uh, help us implement a lot of things, whether it's infrastructure or or other you know, types of urban greening to, to meet our climate action goals and reduce emissions. So the two, the two things come in quickly are, we just received through stimulus money to make, to, to install the first electric, all electric cranes on our terminals, which is a vast improvement to their existing cranes. But, and then also we'll be hosting the first uh, all electric tugboat uh, from Crowley uh, I think by the end of this year. So just a few examples to help us move in that direction, but there's also a lot of other programs that we'll talk about in a few minutes that are helping us try to meet our emissions goals, right? So we've got a, a bunch of different projects that kind of basically or build a profile of nature-based solutions, right? So trying to advance our nature-based solutions profile. Some of these projects um, are 
part of our blue economy incubator, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So e concrete, sunken seaweed, and San Diego Bay aquaculture are just three examples, but they also perform, you know, as an aquaculture product or a shoreline stabilization, uh, bioenhancing concrete solution. They they actually create opportunities for you know, carbon sequestration and other, you know, emission reduction things. But we also have a big effort that we're launching to, um, I'll, I'll explain it in a few minutes, but through our program, we've created, we've done a lot of planning and pre-development to support um, a, creating a more enabling environment for aquaculture and blue tech businesses to move into the port. So we're actually going to be going through a, a programmatic EIR to support some of that. Uh, so that's our shellfish and seaweed aquaculture planning effort. We've got some unique opportunities to study blue carbon and uh, in our eelgrass beds. We'll talk about. We just installed a native oyster living project, a native oyster living shoreline project, three months ago or not six months ago, and we've been working on an old former salt pond in the South Bay to create it into a, uh, a mitigation bank. So this is. Uh, a pond it's called Pond 20. It was a former salt pond. It's in the very south end of the bay uh, that hasn't been used and has basically zero habitat value for the last, you know, many, many decades. So um, it's not that it's called Pond 20, but it's taken 20 years to get to this point um, of where we're actually creating. We got all of our permits in place to create it back into a wetlands habitat and use it for mitigation banking purposes. So that's happening at the port. As we speak, um, we did just install, we got some grant funding from a few agencies and some philanthropic organizations to install 360 of these reef balls that were um, basically uniquely crafted with some oyster shell and set at elevations in the South Bay um, specifically to attract Olympia oysters. So there's been a lot of research in our bay. Olympia and Pacific oysters coexist there, but at different elevations. So this project was specifically designed over a 10 year period to basically hopefully attract just Olympia oysters. So we'll see, it was just installed. But um, you know, one of the things we might hear about today uh, but certainly is an issue is permitting for any types of you know aquaculture projects whether they be commercial or conservation or restoration oriented and this project like everybody loves we're doing restoration and conservation it's a great story but until you try to permit it so this project took us seven years to permit and it's a you know it's it's a great amazing project right but it's just a, it's just a uh, an example of how difficult it is to get even the most amazing things done. So, okay, so, uh, and then San Diego actually, uh, the, the San Diego Bay has 50% of all the eelgrass in Southern California and 17% of the state's eelgrass. So it's actually got, and it, and it kind of grows and shrinks over time, but it's a pretty significant resource that's available to us as not just sensitive habitat, but um, we're starting to, see and study the potential blue carbon benefits of our uh, of our seagrass beds, right? So we've gotten, so this is just some estimates that we did um, through one of our interns last year to understand what our existing stock might be. And it's pretty significant when you look at the amounts of carbon, just in calculations that could be supporting, you know, the equivalent of, you know, 107,000 cars being off the road or, you know, or even, it annually storing stuff in, in, the, in the sediment as well. So we actually are looking at that a bit closer and we received some funding from the Maritime Administration. So what's the Maritime Administration doing funding blue carbon studies with eelgrass? Well, you know, they're looking at ways to, you know, contribute to projects that lower, you know, carbon emissions or, or, or yeah, carbon emissions. So, and looking at how can seagrass as an environmental, play that environmental role and help for our, not just our own ports, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but everywhere else. So they've provided 500,000 over three years. The first year, which we just finished, was a study to just really develop a baseline. So what, what do we have in the blades of eelgrass and then, and then in the sediments um, from a carbon uh, inventory stand of, Standpoint. So that report's coming out pretty soon. We just received another contract for next year where we're going to be looking at the bicarbonate pathway of these um, 
of these habitats to really understand how carbon flows in and out and what we can do to sort of set ourselves up for either more studies that complement other things that are going around uh, and happening with, with our region or, um, or, or even nationally. I mean, there's lots of folks in the room that are doing some really great work with shellfish and, and eelgrass habitats that you'll hear from uh, our folks at Hog Island and a few other folks. So um, really good opportunity, but represents a very good opportunity for us to look at, you know, supporting using uh, aquaculture or conservation as a, as a means to uh, reduce our carbon footprint. So now I'll talk about a little bit more focused on the program that I direct. So our aquaculture and blue technology program, as was described earlier, was created in 2015 to look at environmental and economic opportunities in both of those spaces. And underneath that program, um, we developed what we call a blue economy incubator, but the port, you know, really was looking at creating a new program to help diversify its portfolio of new business lines and figure out how to do it. So it's a really busy area in our San Diego Bay. So we, the first thing that we set out to do, which has actually been six years later now, and we've been doing basically a lot of planning and pre-development. So we've, we've worked with, with a bunch of different partners over the last six years to get us to the point where we are today, which is going through a programmatic EIR to you know, do a lot of that pre-permitting and analysis and environmental review that will hopefully you know, break down some barriers and create a more enable, enabling environment for businesses to move in. So we've done a lot of spatial planning with the NOAA team that's done a lot of siting and coastal analysis. So our area, while we only um, manage 14,000 acres, we did a spatial planning exercise where we eliminated major use conflicts in our area in and around San Diego Bay. So not just in our jurisdiction, but outside San Diego Bay to the state line, which is that black line there is three miles out. Um, what you can't see here is all the military and all the mixed uses that, I mean, when you look at a, a map of all the different uses in and around San Diego Bay, it's really scary. It looks like there's not the ability to do anything. I mean, the Navy actually has circles and squares and all geometry shapes, like all over the place. And then all of those shapes have buffer zones around them and all the buffer zones touch. So it looks like you can't do anything, but actually after eliminating all these major use conflicts and looking at the types of shellfish and seaweed opportunities we could support, we have that all that green area represents about 10,000 acres of potentially usable space in and around San Diego Bay to support aquaculture, basically seaweed and shellfish aquaculture. We didn't look at finfish because finfish is not um, allowed in state waters at the moment, but there's plenty of opportunity for growth in the shellfish and seaweed industry, right? So um, we're looking at that a little bit closer. We went in and looked at sensitive habitat interactions analysis to kind of focus on where our programmatic EIR would look at. So places that might have the best chance of, you know, making the grade for, you know, not just food production, but also, you know, producing animals for, you know, other uses like, you know, bioplastics, fertilizers, or just, you know, bioremediation services. So, and then we've done six years of shellfish really health testing to really develop a baseline and figure out what kind of shellfish work we could do, uh, whether you're at the nursery stage or the grow out stage. So that work is ongoing with one of our pilot projects, but also through our PEIR, we'll be looking at how to, you know, figure out areas that would make the grade to grow animals to market. So, and then we created our incubator. So what does our incubator do? It allows the port to partner with early stage companies in the aquaculture and blue tech space and primarily facilitate pilot projects. So we're not a traditional incubator where we offer um, you know, office space or mentorship, but instead we facilitate pilot projects. And we can't believe this. I still can't believe it, but as our incubator is growing not in, and getting a little bit more, as, we're, as I mean, there's no shortage of blue economy accelerators and everything else out there, but there's, there is a shortage of places that can actually facilitate pilots. So we feel very lucky that that's our core value proposition and it's working, but it's slow, right? When you do something new, you can, you know, we make mistakes, but it can take a long time. So we're six years into it. We're learning a lot and we're positioned for growth, but that's our core value proposition right now. And for the last, we haven't had any new companies in our portfolio in two years because of COVID. 
but we've got nine, right? For, and then 40% of those companies are actually uh, from overseas. So we're not limited to local or United States companies, but people, it's a, it's, it's a signal, right? Like people know that the market is here, right? For not just aquaculture, but for lots of other different things. So we have, um, we're only gonna talk about a couple of these projects today. More information can be found on our website, but they kind of fall into these buckets of, you know, sort of, technology, remediation, aquaculture, and infrastructure. So um, we've got two aquaculture pilots that we'll talk about and one that will be, uh, you'll see the folks later today and tomorrow they're giving a presentation, but um, but we're ready to scale. Like the, we've learned so much from these projects, they're informing, you know, uh, future opportunities or otherwise like solving like unique uh, environmental problems that ports face, right? So. Like many ports, we have legacy pollution areas that have benefited from some of these technologies that, to help us meet, you know, goal or our targets to reduce soluble copper into water. As one example, where we have, you know, a boat wash that that um, that basically acts like a car wash, but the the boats pull into it. It's got a basin underneath the brushes. The brushes brush the bottom of the boat that contains all the copper particulate. And just one way to maybe reduce soluble copper. There's other technologies like eco spears, where the spears go into sediments and suck up PCBs and lo locations that are difficult to cap or dredge. So unique, import environmental challenges, but also um, lots of opportunities for new new business lines. Right. So we've spent 1.6 million in funding to date on these nine projects. We've provided you know leases, use of port on property, um, some other port based asset. And in almost all cases, funding to support the program. And the idea is to support the project with each of those projects having a unique agreement with the port that allows um, a revenue share to pass through to so that company can pay back the investment that the port made with a little bit of an upside. So we can get them established, get us to create more opportunities for the program, and ideally create more you know, new sustainable business tenants at the port. So, so far so good, but we've got a long way to go with some stuff. So I'm just gonna talk about, there are two aquaculture companies and the and the infrastructure company, Econcrete, but this is uh, San Diego Bay Aquaculture, which is a uh, nursery operation for uh, what basically a floating upweller system, floating upweller system equals Flupsy. Um, and it's a, it's a barge that grows uh, oysters from, you know, the, basically the size of a pepper, pepper flake coming out of a hatchery to about the size of a quarter before shipping them to uh, installations to grow them out to market. So we've got a barge that sits in one of our, it's actually at one of our commercial fishing harbors. And um, we've done, you know, we, we, we've, we've, we've had a variety of issues with permitting this project, but um, just goes to show you that you know how hard it is for small business to really start up permits for for any kind of live seafood production you know take a long time to get and you have to build health records and you have to solve uh, problems as they come along and um, we're hopefully going to be opening up this business pretty soon but as just one example in colder water climates this nursery stage from you know, size of a pepper flake to size of the quarter can take a long time, right? So some in, in very cold climates up to a year. But our um, business model in San Diego is, you know, we have warmer water and a lot of nutrients. So we're getting those animals to that size within four to six weeks pretty consistently. So we're hoping that we can get, um, you know, a, this, this Flupsy is actually the fourth uh, one of its kind. The other three are actually up in Humboldt Bay with, with Hog Island. And uh, it's a machine, it works good, it does its job. So we're hoping that we can put lots more oysters in that coming soon. So super good project. Um, the other one is uh, Sunken Seaweed. They'll be here tomorrow talking about their pilot project with us in San Diego Bay, the super successful. They uh, launched a, a, a long line farm at one of our commercial fishing piers, um, which is located on the bottom left of this slide. And over a couple of years, they just tested a bunch of different seaweeds, kelps and culinary seaweeds to grow on the grow out lines there and, and did, you know, basically to test the feasibility of growing all of those different kinds of kelps and seaweeds in San Diego Bay. Super successful project. They've leveraged many hundreds of thousands of dollars more 
than our investment in grant funding to look at lots of different, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity for seaweed and shellfish, right? In California, you're gonna hear a lot about that. But this project in particular was, it, it offers so many other things. There's tank-based culture, which you guys are gonna hear about, which is very important for land-based production of these seaweeds and other things. But in our environment, some of the grant funding that they got was to look at the bioremediation capacity of in spe specifically the sea lettuce, which is the bottom middle slide, uh, which is ulva. And it's just really incredible looking at the carbon and the nitrogen, heavy metals and other uptake that that has in, in this particular environment. This pier is located at one of our larger stormwater outfalls. And so it's just been an amazing project. Um, there's lots more to do, but there's so many other purposes for, you know, a seaweed farm other than food production, right? It just, it's this ecosystem services stuff is no joke. So, um, and they've tested their products, product, sorry, at um, our local fishery, fisherman's market, which is Tuna Harbor Dockside Market. It's super, super popular. And we're, we've been able to have some of our aquaculture products there from time to time. So we're looking at that being a main, you know, sort of terminal market in our location that's super successful. And uh, here's just some more, they've leveraged their site. Um, they had a small hatchery down the road from us in San Diego Bay um, at San Diego State University. So, and then they've done a lot of other work on land-based, you know, farming opportunities that they got grant funding for with local universities and nonprofits in our area. But they're actually gonna scale their operations up in Humboldt, which is really um, an exciting opportunity for them and for us at the port um, as we get ready to ramp up our land-based production of things. And then lastly, um, we'll talk about eConcrete, which is a company that's created a bioenhancing concrete solution for products that can actually support basically more nature-based solutions to green greening infrastructure, right? So basically having a solution that creates uh, habitat enhancement while still maintaining the structural integrity of, you know, a port seawall as an example. So, and our, uh, our project with them was specific to what's called coastal lock, right? So it's an interlocking tide pool unit made of this special concrete mix mixture, which actually attracts marine life to it. And it was installed in uh, 72 of these tide pools were installed in two locations along one of our, one of our shorelines, right? In, re in, 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 re uh, sorry, re as a replacement for traditional riprap. So San Diego Bay, we manage 34 miles of San Diego Bay. And so 70% of San Diego Bay is armored with some type of, you know, riprap or other armored shoreline. So and a lot of it is aging. Like this riprap is, you know, 60 or 70 years old now. So, and it has no habitat value. So this was a really exciting project for us to try out. Um, the company wanted to gain access to the California market. Um, they're established worldwide and they have pilot projects in other places, but this is the first pilot for this particular project uh, product, the Coastal Lock. So, and so it's created these artificial tide pools that, you know, like oysters grow like mad in the bay, but everything else grows like mad in the bay. So we have a joke that you put your finger in the water and something grows on it in the bay because it's so productive. So in, um, this is only six months after those tide pools were installed. It's just a massive reef. Like it's, in, it's incredible. Like for everything from mussels to lobsters to nudibranchs, like it's amazing, right? So the company, we have a two year pilot project with them. They come back every six months to do monitoring. This was after the first six months, which was basically the end of December. They're doing their other, their next sampling right now. And we're gonna hopefully present on that in a couple of, uh, couple of weeks, but super great project very successful. Animals love it. People love it. Birds love it. Um, and then we have this thing called the highlights report that we do every year, right? It's a scorecard that we basically try to track the impact of our companies, right? Everybody has a key, you know, a, a scope of work with us, an agreement with us, key performance indicators that they have to meet and measure. And we, we produce, you know, this impact report every year. This is the second um, edition, which is actually, you know, well past the second edition. So uh, the third edition is coming out in July. So, and then we'll actually, through stimulus money that we received post COVID, we've gotten money to actually um, 
invest in, in new companies. So the first time in two years, we've gotten some funding to support uh, new pilot projects. So we're reviewing a big portfolio right now of new businesses. So we'll be hopefully reporting that next time. But, and at the core of all that is Baywide collaboration, right? So the port's pretty big, but we have a lot of different departments. We just can't do anything. Our little project that's trying to get, our program that's trying to get off the ground can't be possible without everybody from engineering folks to electricians and farmers and finance people. At the bottom right is three commissioners. The middle guy was the guy who was supposed to be here. Um, Rafael Castellanos, he's our biggest proponent of the blue economy at the Port of San Diego. But those three, those three commissioners created the program six years ago. So I am personally thankful for that, but we all are. So thank you for so much for letting me be here and um, super happy to be part of this. So thanks. Are you okay with that was an amazing kickoff thank you so now we're going to talk about uh, harbor and city infrastructure needs um, i'm going to take an opportunity right from right in the beginning just to introduce myself i've met a lot of you via email and on Zoom calls. My name is Sarah McCormick, and I work for the City of Fort Bragg on housing and economic development projects. Uh, as a how we got here moment, I just want to let you all know that when COVID came to Fort Bragg, a city that heavily relies on our transit occupancy taxes, so we were all sheltering in place and our hotels weren't filled. I think everybody here got scared. We realized we needed to diversify our economy before that, but then we really realized we needed to. And the CARES Act, one of the things they did was they provided a lot of funding to the um, Economic Development Association. And EDA invested in Fort Bragg and we did a diversification study. We were able to contract out with RGS and I was fortunate enough to meet uh, Josh Metz and David Spar, who's now serving as the city's interim city manager. Um, you know, that when we first were looking at our assets here, it just, it's obvious, right? You're here, it's the ocean. And then you look around this community and you're like, it's obvious, it's the people we have along, you know? And so we just kind of started there. And reaching out to Paula down in San Diego and Larry Odeker up in Humboldt, they said, yes, do this, follow this thread. You know, there is a lot of opportunity here. And um, that's what we've been doing for the past year. So, we had a last May, we had a stakeholder meeting. There was about 25 of us and we spent all day. It was everybody that was there is either presenting here or homesick. Um, we carried the conversation um, throughout the years, we reached out to California Sea Grant. I had didn't even know this program existed. And I just did, you know, the blanket email. Hi, I need help. And they responded. And I've been working with um, Kevin Johnson and Luke Gardner on a regular basis for the ever since then, since last uh, May, we put together this symposium for you all that was scheduled October and so happy that you all made the trip up here now. We couldn't do it in October because COVID madness, but we're here and um, the conversation is continuing and it's even grown. So over, this, over, over the last six months or so, um, we've been working as a region and really pulling our pulling a team together. We tentatively are even branded ourselves. We'll see how, how far this goes. But right now we're calling ourselves the Noyo Ocean Collective. And it involves the city of Fort Bragg, the Noyo Harbor District, District, Sherwood Valley Band of Pomo Indians, Mendocino College, Noyo Center for Marine Science, and West Business Development Center. And we all started meeting around the time when 
um, build back better regional coalition opportunities started coming up. But we started looking at, wow, you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna really have something transformative happen in our community, we need to work together and we need to pull in a lot of resources at once because we have a lot of infrastructure that needs improvement, improving, a lot of work that needs to be done here. Um, but like I said, we are primed for it. We have really, really smart nature-based practical skills in this area and we have um, beautiful marine resources and we have a lot of energy here um, our vice mayor is testament to that so i just want to say thank you to everybody and um, let you know that this this conversation is just getting kicked off today and we invited you here and we invited our community to also tune in so uh, there's a lot of people that are listening to what we're talking about and are going to be continuing to have that conversation through the weekend. If you don't have anything to do, stay. If you all in your agenda got the activities for the learning festival that's going on. And um, yeah, welcome to Fort Bragg and hope that hope that you enjoy your stay here and that you come back. Um, right now, I'm going to turn it over to two consultants that I've had the pleasure of working with, uh, Radica De Silva and Tim Hogan. They have, um, they're helping me kind of on two phases. We were we were looking at, okay, permitting is impossible for like an ocean water intake. We really need this type of infrastructure in order to provide water to the Noyo Center for Marine Science so they can have the aquariums, provide the water so that we can have aquaculture, restorative research that we're interested in doing, and also so we can provide opportunities for commercial aquaculture. And we don't really, we didn't really know where to begin. We didn't know how much it would cost, what type of studies would be needed. And so we really, we used, leveraged some CDBG funds that we had to hire these two individuals. And they've really just helping us look at concept designs and cost estimates. And we're gonna take that as a baseline and move it forward so that we can ask for additional funding to actually um, build it out. So, Tim's on the more of that helping me meet with all the regulators. Many of you um, we've met with. We've met with the Coastal Commission, the State Lands Commission, um, the both the state and the Regional Water Quality Board. And then pending, we have uh, CDFW and somebody else. All, who, everybody's invited. If I didn't mention you, just talk, not trying to leave you out of the conversation. Uh, so yeah, we've started the conversation and we're, they're going to share what they've come up with. And so thank you both for being here and helping our helping us figure this out. Oh, thank you. how the voice recognition worked with my accent. Thank you. So Tim and I are going to talk about the ocean water intake and discharge. I'm Radhika De Silva, as Sarah said, I'm with ASA Analysis and Communication. And Tim Hogan is with uh, TWB Environmental Research. We, Tim and I will walk you through um, the project needs, site conditions, uh, regulatory requirements, and regulatory outreach to date, and also talk about subsurface water intake types that we considered, surface water intake types we considered, and the presently preferred intake configuration that we have, and also the presently uh, preferred discharge configuration and the next steps. So Sarah talked about the overall regional goals and the planned programs in terms of the Blue Economy Innovation Center and the Noya Marine Science Center. Tim and I will focus on the water piece, how to withdraw appropriate quantities of appropriate quality water, and then how to discharge the treated effluent. So these are the intake and discharge features that we are looking for. On the intake side, we want the water quality to be compatible with end use. We want sufficient dissolved oxygen and preferably be devoid of toxins. 
water quality should be consistent and the quantities should be reliable and then the impact to natural resources should be as low as possible. On the discharge side, we would like the effluent to rapidly mix with the ocean upon discharge and again have minimal impact. These are photographs of the existing Fort Bragg wastewater treatment facility. Oops, did I hit something incorrect? All right. The existing wastewater treatment facility is a conventional secondary sewage treatment plant. It has aeration, clarification, solid digestion, and chlorination. And this is a photograph of the chlorination tank. You'll hear a little bit more of it later on. When the facility was first built, the outfall was at the shoreline. And in order to meet ocean plan requirements, the outfall was extended about 1,300 feet offshore. Um, and there's a 14 port linear diffuser there now. Great, thanks, Radhika. Uh, so I'm I'm Tim Hogan. Sorry, in the middle of this, you'll get a piece of introduction. So I think one one key thing to point out to Radhika is an engineer. I'm a biologist with some background in fish protection at industrial water intake. So that's sort of my role in the project. I think what we heard from the previous speaker um, and everyone's fully aware of is the challenge uh, that comes with permitting any infrastructure in the ocean here in California. So this, this is not something that we take lightly, you know, Radica's charge is to come up with a conceptual design that's feasible to build and reliable to operate. And my charge is to make sure that we can get through the permitting gauntlet. So we are trying to do as much outreach as possible. So when we think about uh, the regulatory requirements for this type of open ocean intake infrastructure, we look at you know, which regulations apply. Since this is a, a slightly different use for that feed water, it's not seawater desalination, it's not a, you know, a thermal power plant where we're just accepting heat. You know, we look to the, the main regulation being the ocean plan. Um, and the two pieces are the intake side and the discharge side. So on the intake side, the most recent detailed information that's available is in a desalination amendment to the ocean plan, which came out in 2015. And it states that you have to first look at a subsurface intake to provide the water for your facility. And if that's not feasible, you can look at a surface water intake. Uh, since the, the use for the water in this case for a blue economy facility um, it's, it's critical that we have essentially raw seawater because we don't know who the intended tenants will be somewhere down the line. So we're moving towards a regulatory process for a surface water intake in this case. And the regulations dictate that it has to be a one millimeter screen designed for a half foot per second through slot velocity, which is not a minor undertaking for an engineer in an open ocean environment. We have to make sure that it doesn't get fouled. And there's, there's an awful lot of work ongoing in this area. You know, there are paints you can put on it to reduce fouling. There are various ways you can manage it. So the technologies that we're leaning towards here are those that require the least um, operation and maintenance cost. Sorry, that got a little bit off track from the regulations. <laughs> and then the second part, you know, after we figure out the intake is what do we do with the wastewater effluent that comes out of a facility that's supporting marine research, aquaculture, aquariums, because there are constituents in there that need to be treated through this process. And so, you know, we, we have pretty strict regulations that are laid out in the ocean plan about what those uh, water quality requirements are. Um, I thought this was interesting. So we stuck it in here. You know, when we go to the ocean plan as our guiding document for the regulatory process, we see that there are exceptions to the exceptions to the rule. And we've listed them here as they appear in the ocean plan. Most of these are similar facilities, you know, marine research, aquaculture, aquariums. 
So we sort of, we feel like we fit pretty well in that category as, as well. And I think this is the last slide I have. So I'm gonna drag it out as long as I can. So Radica has to rush. So of course, what, what we always hear is regulators want outreach early and often. And we layer on top of that, the complexities in California for what the regulatory process can be, you know, six years to get something in the water in, in San Diego Bay when it seems like sort of a no brainer. So we wanna make sure we're, we're including everyone on the list. And if you are a regulatory authority here and you don't see your name on the list, please come see us afterwards and we'll make sure that we give you a little rundown of what we're, what we're looking to do. But, but as you saw, or as you heard um, Sarah mentioned, we, we, you know, we've met with the state board, the regional board, um, state lands commission, coastal commission, and then you can see the other folks that we're looking to sort of catch up with um, here in the process. These are the subsurface water intakes that we looked at. I'm, going, I'm not going to go through each of them individually, um, but we'll be here today, tomorrow to answer questions. Please come talk to us. And Tim and I also made a little video that's on YouTube that you can watch to get a little more detail. We'd love to talk to uh, talk into the details. Uh, just add, we have a table set up outside as well. So we'll have one of our computers running. If someone wants any more detail, just come um, So the top left is a vertical beach well. Uh, this is a rainy well infiltration gallery, a slant well, and a horizontal well. Something that we see common across all these subsurface intakes is that uh, one of the key advantages is that they filter out a algae, organic matter, and transparent exopolymer particles. This is a real advantage if you're a desalination facility. And much of the research on those different subsurface intakes have been done in the context of desalination facilities. The same advantages, these become disadvantages when it comes to aquaculture and aquariums, because this is food. This is the lowest level of the food web. So you want this stuff in the water. Another issue that we noticed or learned is that subsurface water intakes, the water in there has low dissolved oxygen. So that's incompatible with the, the intended uses. And the salinity of subsurface water intakes is also lower. How much lower? Depends on the particular configuration and type of subsurface water intake. There are several other issues as well, but the long and short of it is subsurface water intakes would very likely be incompatible with the intended uses at Fort Bragg. These are the surface water intake types that we looked at, traveling water screens, onshore ridge wire screens, velocity caps, and we looked at two types of offshore ridge wire screens. Again, there are pros and cons. The key advantage here is that the water quality would be compatible with the intended use. All these technologies are in use around the country, so tried and tested technologies. The new onshore technology or infrastructure that would be needed would be located at the existing wastewater treatment facility, the below profile out of sight, and they would have no impact on freshwater aquifers or wetlands and they're able to provide a um, reliable water supply. The disadvantage, and this is true for any technology, is the challenge of building it. This is true whether it's subsurface or surface water intake. In subsurface water intakes, there are so many other challenges that the challenges of construction seems a lesser issue, but here we need to overcome that. Based on our evaluation thus far, we found that offshore which wire screens would have the least impact and the best performance capability. This is a transverse view of the uh, offshore which wire system. The which wire screens would be installed out here, out in the water, about 20, 30 feet of water. And there would be a wet well at the existing wastewater treatment plant using abandoned uh, spaces. And the two need to be connected. 
we looked at two potential pipeline configurations. The first one, we presented as option one, the pipeline would be somewhat sometimes um, on the seabed, but mostly under the seabed, and it would be drilled through the bluffs and would flow the water via gravity into the wet well. This configuration is very difficult to construct, costly and challenging, and a lot of uncertainties. The second pipeline configuration uh, would lay the pipe on the seabed, on the bluffs, and would require pumping and discharge into this wet well. And all the end users, whether it's a uh, blue tech business or aquaculture would withdraw their water from this wet well. This is a plan view. The black labels show existing infrastructure. The white labels show proposed infrastructure. This gray line shows an existing easement. That's the easement where the existing uh, wastewater outfall is uh, constructed. The virtual screen would be installed somewhere in there, east of the current diffuser, and the pipeline would be laid within the easement and would feed a wet well, which is one of two trickling filters that's no longer in use. The blue economy programs would withdraw water there. The treated effluent from the blue economy uses would be discharged into a second wet well, which is another trickling filter that's not in use anymore. And water from there would be pumped to a location downstream of the chlorine contact tank. The uh, wastewater or effluent shouldn't go into the existing wastewater treatment facility. There is so much head at this location. This treatment plant sits about 50 feet above sea level. So you don't need pumps to move the water. There's so much energy there. However, you want to pump so that you can control the flow on how much is released, depending on how the wastewater treatment facility is operating. This is the preferred layout as we see it. Of course, I'm sure it will see many configurations and changes. The system would be designed for 1 million gallons per day and would treat a single 12 inch pipe. The system would have two screens. Each would be about 24 inches high and 20 inches in diameter. Um, and the slot size, as Tim said, would be about one millimeter. And that results in about 36% uh, open area. When both screens are in operation, the velocity through the slots would be less than a quarter foot per second. The system needs only one screen, but we suggest using two screens to provide 100% redundancy in case one needs to be taken out for maintenance purposes or taken offline because stuff happens out in the ocean. The system will still work as intended. Um, the screens, it's a highly corrosive environment, so it'll be made of super duplex stainless steel. It's expensive, but in the long run, fully worth it normally. And uh, there would be brushes on the inside and the outside because fouling is a real issue in this environment. You need to plan for that upfront. And the pipeline, stuff grows even in the pipeline. Over time, the pipe will get smaller and smaller because of the stuff that grows in there. So there, it would need to have a picking system. This is a, the configuration for the discharge. The effluent quality that gets to that effluent wet well would already meet ocean plan requirements. It's a matter of then getting it to uh, the outfall. The ocean plan require, has sort of stages of uh, what an outfall needs to be for desalination, not for this type of facility. The uh, ocean plan doesn't cover it as closely. One is that it mixes with an existing wastewater treatment plant effluent. This already does that. In case that's not available to a desalination facility, the ocean plan requires that the effluent be discharged via a multi-port diffuser. 
the diffuser already exists and has capacity to accept the blue economy effluent. So the discharge already meets ocean plan requirements. In terms of next steps, there are several additional studies that need to get done. We need to look at the integrity of the bluffs. You can't blast at this location because of the existing infrastructure. So digging is what's needed, but it's very costly and time consuming, and we don't know if it's even possible. So that needs to get evaluated. Geotechnical work, bathymetric studies, benthic studies, entrainment studies, it's a long list. And then modeling to see how the effluent would mix, because many of these requirements stem from regulatory requirements. We need to demonstrate that uh, the impacts would be minimal or none. Then further regulatory outreach that Sarah and Tim are planning, and then Sarah has to find funding for all that. We hope you have lots of questions for us. Please stop by the table for questions today, tomorrow or contact us via email. We would love to continue this conversation. Thank you for your attention. And if I could ask um, John Smith and Alden to stand and wave to everybody. And if everybody looked and turned around, there's our public works director and Alden runs our wastewater treatment plant. So if you have more questions about how our wastewater treatment plant operates now, because they just did a huge upgrade, it's running extremely clean. Um, there's a big investment that was put into it. I didn't, we didn't include it as a, as a presentation, but it's worth learning about. Um, so those are the guys that you talk to about it. Hi all, my name is Anna Newman and I'm the Harbor Master for the Noyo Harbor District. Just kidding. is a good use because I didn't have that much to say so yeah. really <laughs> okay so today I want to go through the community sustainability plan with you all as we look forward into blue economies it's really important that we realize what has already been tasked for the harbor district to do in 2019 the harbor district put out a request for the community to see what are our needs for our current blue economies now this I'm really talking about the traditional style fisheries commercial as well as recreational and the public came back with 11 key projects for us. So to everyone in this room, this is kind of what we're already scheduled to take on. And even before we can move into new blue economies, this basic infrastructure need is going to be hugely important for anyone that comes in. So I'm gonna go in depth into these 11 projects. Here are all 11 of them, as always with every PowerPoint, there's always one slide with too much text. Here is mine. We're gonna start off with a fuel dock. So this is the number one project onto the CSP. Currently our boats fuel over the tidelands, they call a truck. It takes about two days to get an appointment with the truck. The truck comes down, strings a line over the tidelands and they fuel that way. This is permittable and it is permitted. However, it is not effective, cost effective for our fishermen or really effective for anyone. In case of a spill, the response times would be quite slow here. I would have to come over in my harbor boat. I can boom everything and clean it up that way, but it's just not how we wanna operate. We're the only marina in California that I know of that does not have a fuel dock. There is a fuel dock in Dolphin Isle, which is the marina just up the ways from us. However, it is an extreme challenge to get to. Low tides and a very small port, it's located in the back of that marina. So anything past a 15 foot boat, best of luck, my friends. And we do want to fuel boats over 15 feet, which is why we really need this fuel dock to come in. Now, there are huge challenges here. As we all know, California is really moving away from fossil sized fuels. We're seeing electric cars come in. So we want to install fuel in California over tidelands. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so the permitting there is going to be our biggest challenge, as well as ensuring that any oil spills can be responded to rapidly and that we're gonna be succinct and efficient so we don't degradate our local environment. 
And there's also access considerations. We need to be able to fuel the small sport boats that come in the 20 footers up to the 75 foot commercial fleet that fishes actively out of our harbor. We've also been talking, oh yeah. Do, 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 do. Aha. Ta -da. We've also been talking a lot with Bodega and Humboldt Bay, and they're saying that a lot of the fleet that moves between these two ports has to really time the winds and the swells right if their fuel tanks aren't allowing them to get from one port to the other. They don't come into Noyo for that reason. They'll stay farther out to shore. They won't hug the coastlines. So we do think that we're going to see a huge increase in our marina's uses if we can offer a basic service like fuel. So right now we're open to any and all considerations as we look forward with the fuel dock. We've been talking to ports to see if their fuel docks are private or public or a joint venture. And then we're searching in our community to see how we can make that happen. We could even have the potential to mix jurisdictions here between the city, the county, and the harbor. At this point, we know that fuel is so critical in our marina that any conversation is a conversation that the harbor district is willing and happy to have. The next is an ice house. Another very important part of the commercial fishing industry is ice. Currently, there is an ice house that is located in North Harbor. There are rumors on the wind because this is a small town that that ice house may want to get out of the ice business. And in that case, the Harbor District is very open to those conversations to see what it would look like to have the Harbor District take that over, how it would be managed, would it stay a public and private joint venture? Would we take it over fully? These are all options that we're really looking into and explore. Fuel and ice are the two big ones for our commercial fleet to remain active. We know without these, we're sunk in the water, so to speak. So many good puns and sayings when you're a harbor master. It's really makes me happy. So dredging is another great one, so access. I am happy to report that the Army Corps of Engineers is going to dredge the river up to the Mooring Basin in 2023. There's also money in their budget to do some repairs to our jetty. And then the Harbor District is working with a local engineering firm and group to get our Mooring Basin dredged. We haven't been dredged since 2015, so we're well due in time to get that dredged so our boats don't rest on the bottom anymore. North Harbor vehicle access and parking. For all of you locals, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Going into North Harbor on a busy Saturday can be scary. Um, there's cars all over the place. The sides of the roads are slowly deteriorating. So we're looking at how this could possibly look with vehicle access. In the case of an emergency, if you have a couple large cars and trucks parked on the side of the road, or some restaurant here is getting their Cisco delivery, there's a potential for vehicle, emergency vehicle access to not be able to reach where they need to go. It's extremely dangerous. And once again, small towns and rumors on the wind of trying to make this into a one-way instead of a two-way street. However, that would put the road out onto Pomo land. So now we're mixing county, city, harbor, and Pomo jurisdictions and trying to make sure that everything is safe and incorporated and everyone gets what they need and desire and all those um, political governments can really talk and work together. So huge challenges there. The other big challenge that we faced and hopefully found a solution for is parking. There were four charter boats that operated out of the North Harbor, which can bring 50 to 80 cars in on any given day. Thankfully, they park uh, sometimes well and sometimes not at 7 in the morning. So any bad parking decisions made at 7 a.m. affect the restauranteurs for the rest of the day. The issue there is that a charter boat uh, participant or customer, I guess, can park in front of a local business in prime uh, restaurant property and then not go in and eat at that restaurant later in the day. So they've really just taken up prime parking for three to four hours on a busy, busy Saturday prime season. And these restauranteurs are going, hey, there's no space for uh, my own businesses to come in or my own clients to come in. So we are now allowing charter boats to come into the Mooring Basin and park on ADOC and utilize the very large parking that has already existed in the South Harbor. So that's kind of how we've solved the, at least the parking issue, or hopefully. Mooring Basin Redevelopment. While fuel is definitely the number one on the CSP, a Mooring Basin Redevelopment is my most expensive project for all the most obvious reasons. Right? This is going to be a bear to tackle. Right now, our Mooring Basin is really 
original infrastructure. So it was put into place in the 1950s. And we all know how well steel and metal hold up with seawater. So I have some pretty deteriorated brackets. We are working through a FEMA OES grant to do some modifications and some updates with our infrastructure, but we do need to update entirely from wood to concrete, especially if we're gonna start looking into these bigger blue economies and having these larger boats and infrastructure come in. We wanna be able to support that in the event of a large tsunami or any heavy tidal flows. Right now, there's always serious concerns if there's too much wind, rain, and swell, whether or not our boats are gonna be moving enough to break apart our current infrastructure. We also need to do a full electrical update on all of our docks. So big project. <laughs> a fish cleaning station is a little bit more of a fun project. So I'm actually happy to announce that the State Lands Commission did grant the Harbor District funds to do a fish cleaning station for the recreational boaters. This is going to go on the western side of Greater Park, which is a beautiful little park we have right downtown in South Harbor. Um, the fish cleaning station is going to incorporate a multi-use larger style pavilion and then we're going to have ADA sidewalks as well as a cold water shower. I know there's a lot of research divers in the group and when I was a young research diver any shower at the end of the day was better than no shower. Our hope with the larger style pavilion is that we can remove that table and use the event space to host other folks for memorials or birthday parties, graduations, and really reinvigorate and incorporate the South Harbor's beautiful park and um, back into our community. So a local coastal programs update, lots of fun. An LCP and I'm sorry if I get this wrong, it's kind of what I'm gathering what an LCP is, is a comprehensive and long-term plan that outlines the physical development as well as the land uses in the coastal zone. So this program would really be a compilation between the city and the harbor to get our programs updated so we can understand exactly what is allowed and what isn't allowed in the mooring basin and in the harbor itself. There is funds coming for this specifically related to sea level rise from the California Coastal Commission as well as the California Coastal Coast Conservancy. So we are working together with the city to really move forward and attain those goals. Attraction of new and more fish buyers and processors. So this was a really fun one for me to take on because prior to being a harbor master, I was a fishmonger. So I really understood how to sell fish to the public. And what I really was concerned about when I originally saw this on the community sustainability plan is I don't want to attract a new large conglomerate business to come in and undercut and take away the businesses of our already established fish buyers. We need to find something else. But I did know from working as a fishmonger that our community loves to eat fish, there just wasn't a great way for them to buy fresh local fish really until a fish market opened up in North Harbor just a couple of years ago. So with this, our idea was that we would attract folks into South Harbor on designated days. So just a shameless plug, I have a fish market this weekend. We're going to have 17 vendors in the park. There's going to be live music. The fishermen will be selling off the docks. You as a community can go down and meet your fishermen, understand who they are, learn about what they do, and know that your catch is local and fresh while like, you know, meeting the man who, or woman who catches your, your food. Gear storage and repair. So it's no shock when I say that fishermen have lots of gear, especially as many of our fleet has moved to diversification. So we've got guys that fish crab, salmon, tuna, as well as black cod, and then they'll do the near shore rockfish fisheries. All of these require different sets of gear, which means in the off seasons, their gear must be stored somewhere. The current Harbor District has two storage yards and we are completely at capacity with these yards and I get calls all the time looking for 20 to 30 feet of space for this truck and trailer or for this set of black cod gear. The solution here is quite simple. It's the acquisition of land. It's simple but also expensive. Now this acquisition can be done by the Harbor District or even a private venture. Somewhere near the marina would be ideal so the fishermen don't have to travel long distances. Improved hoist facilities. So I am excited to announce that our hoist is installed on our new high dock and it is fully functional. The fleet's been utilizing it and we're quite happy to have a project be checked off our list. Boat yard and marine service haul outs. So this is my final project. The closest haul out is Eureka or Bodega. This is a huge problem for our fleet. It, 
allows a lot of deferred maintenance to be easily deferrable because you don't want to go all the way to Eureka or all the way to Humboldt to do it. It also means less time at home for our men. If they have to go to Eureka for two weeks and they're already gone for the entire crab season, the entire salmon season, and then they go for tuna, it's less time with their families. So there is a potential for a joint venture here, the rental of land from the Harbor District or perhaps someone who's a great boat smith um, can come in and really kind of help our fleet. Um, there are two launches in the Mooring Basin where we can use perhaps a larger gantry style crane or even a hydraulic hoist to incorporate our boats, pull them out and then work on them in some sort of nearby yard. So those are the projects that the community has already tasked us with. We're going full force onto all of these projects equally. Some of them are obviously a little bit easier to accomplish, such as a fish cleaning station versus a fuel dock or even the larger uh, mooring basin redevelopment. But I do think it is important for everyone in this room to understand the basic needs of our communities that already exist, that we've already been tasked with as we move forward. Thank you guys. We're all so excited. We're talking fast and we're ahead of schedule. So rather than taking a half hour break, which seems like a bit of overkill, let's take a 15 minute break and come back at. What, 245? Okay. So let's come back at 245. There's a restroom, there's water, there's coffee. Um, there's also, you can take and walk around the block, get some exercise and then come back and sit for a little bit more in fun.
All right, we're going to get started in the afternoon panel discussion with our Noyo Harbor entrepreneurs. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Wanna, you wanna go no, you're okay. Oh, I'm going to take this thing off. There we go. Um, really glad to see you all here. I'm really glad to have the opportunity to uh, bring some perspective from the fishing community to the discussion this afternoon. My name is Carrie Pomeroy. I'm a research social scientist with the Institute of Marine Sciences at UC Santa Cruz. I also spent 15 years working for California Sea Grant. Uh, up until about 2020. And as part of that work, I had the honor and privilege to work with the fishing community here and elsewhere up and down the coast and learn a lot, um, what felt like a lot, definitely, I'm sure it was just a tiny speck of the complexities of fisheries and fishing communities from a human dimensions perspective. Uh, and so I'm really happy to be able to be here and co-chairing this panel session where we'll hear from folks in the fishing community. My partner in crime, no crime, just alleged. Um, I am Jocelyn Ennevoldson, also very happy to be here. Uh, thank you so much for the technical assistance. So um, I've been working in community engagement um, in the context of marine policy for about the past decade, including with fishing communities and coastal business owners from the Southern California border up to the Northern Oregon border. So it's great to kind of land right here in the middle-ish um, today and enough about me. So excited to uh, share this time with our community experts, um, our fishing community members here. And so without further ado, we bring you the Fort Bragg Fisheries Panel. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Ooh, I'm in the well under under that little uh, photo shot up there is the word panelists. Um, and we have with us today a number of folks from the fishing community. We have a couple folks uh, who are missing for various reasons. Uh, Heather Sears, who is prepping for an event later this evening. Joe Kaido, who for health reasons, has opted to stay put. Uh, and uh, Michelle Norval, who is, I believe, welcoming a grandchild uh, as of boy. yesterday. It's a boy. It's a boy. So we're very sorry she's unable to join us, but she gave me a, a, she left me a message the other day saying she would really like to participate, but that had to take priority. Understandable. Um, all right. And so what we'd like to do this afternoon with our panelists is actually start by asking each of you in turn, to just introduce yourself and uh, tell us uh, very briefly about the hat or hats you wear vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Fort Bragg Fisheries, Noyo Harbor Fisheries and Fishing Community. So actually, I'll go down to the end of the table and start with Grant. Uh, may just have to speak up loudly. <laughs> Pass this test. All right, we're on. All right. Hi, my name's Grant Downey. I'm a local to Fort Bragg here, born and raised, graduated from Fort Bragg High School. And I am also a second generation sea urchin diver here on the Mendocino Coast. And in the last four years, I have really branched out doing a lot of kelp restoration work, trying to restore the reefs back to the healthy state they were before the disaster of 2014. Thanks, Grant. Kevin. Hello, my name is Kevin Browning. I'm with uh, Noyo Fish Company here in Fort Bragg and also know your fish charter. So I actually wear one more hat than Scott, but Scott has many more hats than most of us do have in the harbor. Um, I've been coming up to Fort Bragg in the fishery since the eighties and uh, was a member of Scott when we started the know your fish company back in the early or mid two thousands there. And uh, ready for any of your questions. Great, thanks Bob. My name is uh, Bob Juntz. I came here in 1984 with my brother and we started a uh, sea urchin uh, business. We came as divers and 
um, quickly got into the urchin processing and I was at one time the Georgia Pacific of sea urchin processors, mm -hmm. if you can believe it. But uh, anyway, I've made a career up to, well, as of about so many, since the kelp died, my, my business kind of died with it. But um, we had 30 good years of a really good business here. I own three uh, big, uh, two lots in the harbor and a big building right on the, on the Noyo River there across from Kaido Fisheries. So I do whatever I can in that space to, uh, to make, make a business. And that's, that's what I'm doing right now. Thank you, Scott. Scott Hockett, uh, Noyo Fish Company, Noyo Ice, just, we have several commercial fishing vessels. We market in the Bay Area. Some here we can afford to. Uh, restaurant, I don't know what else, but we're here every day in the harbor and, and uh, appreciate these gentlemen coming and participating. Dan. Thanks. And Dan. Yeah, so I'm Dan Platt and I'm currently wearing my uh, captain's hat. I'm the uh, owner of, and operator of Nellio Harbor Tours. Um, besides that, I've been a commercial fisherman all my life. Uh, started fishing with my dad when I was about 10 years old. And uh, after I graduated from high school, I moved to uh, Fort Bragg. Uh, I went to school in Point Arena. I moved to Fort Bragg and uh, worked on local boats for a couple of years. And I got a job on a boat called the Sea Valley too that um, fished in Alaska. And I worked for them for 12 years. And uh, when I retired off that boat and came back to Fort Bragg, I bought the uh, boat that I have now that I fish uh, commercially for salmon, um, rockfish and black cod with. I'm also a one of the members of the Pacific Fishery Management Council that uh, I'm a fisherman representative on the council and uh, we manage all the West Coast fisheries. Great. So thank you, Dan. And I, I, I wanted to start us off with the understanding. So me as not a fisherman, not a fishing community member, but to say that based on conversations with these folks and others over the years, you know, Fort Bragg, as many of you probably know, has a really rich and varied history with commercial recreational um, and, and subsistence fisheries. And um, the community, the different types of fisheries and fishery participants and the whole support system that enables that to happen have faced some opportunities and challenges over time. And I think Anna did, you know, Anna, thank you. You set us up really nicely. Um, uh, it's it was really good to have that rundown of all these challenges in a sense, but also these opportunities that the harbor is facing and the fishing community is part of that is facing. So I just wanted to sort of set that as the stage and then turn to our panelists and ask each of you, you know, you have the the elevator speech opportunities we sometimes say or the, you know, the the one to two minute spiel. If you were to try to tell somebody, help somebody understand what it is about the Fort Bragg and Noyo Harbor fishing community that is notable. You know, what's important down there? And thinking about it sort of in the context of blue economy, but also the community, what, what would you highlight for them? So Dan, do you have a thought on that for starters? Sure. Um, one thing that this Fort Bragg in this area, this coast, the coast has is a lot of really good habitat for rockfish and sea urchins. So talk about uh, used to be kelp. There's not so much kelp now, but rocky reefs, um, uh, you know, and, and just good areas for rockfish. So the, uh, there's a real good opportunity for both uh, recreational and commercial fishermen to uh, smaller boats to not have to go too far and access some pretty healthy fishing stocks. Um, at one time we had, I don't know, there must have been 
50 or 60 um, trawl vessels in Fort Bragg. And uh, back in early 2000, there was a grand fish fishery disaster where there, I think there was some 35 species of rockfish that were declared overfished or in danger of overfishing. And uh, what the management council did at that point was the first thing they did was they did a buyback on the trawl fleet. And there was several vessels in the Fort Bragg area that sold out to that buyback. And uh, that reduced our local fleet by about almost 40%. Um, and uh, an interesting side note to that is that the harbor really depended on the trawl fleet. It was like the bread and butter of the harbor. So when we talk about losing infrastructure, that was kind of when it all started. These boats fished every day, you know, brought a lot of fish into the harbor, big volumes of fish. Um, what happened after that was, uh, I think about eight years ago now, the uh, Management Council implemented a um, individual fishing quota system on the West Coast trawl fleet, the entire West Coast trawl fleet. So that's Oregon, Washington, and California. And um, one of the things that that program did was um, it actually raised the cost. There was some benefit to it, to the individual trawl boats, but it raised the cost of their operations. There was a lot of additional costs that came with the program. One of those is that they have to have a federal fisheries observer on the boat every time they go fishing and they have to pay for that. And so the, there was some attrition in the fleet because of that. And we lost a few more boats because of that. Guys just decided, you know, they didn't want to pay the additional costs and stuff. I have to say that the remaining boats in the fishery, Scott can tell you a little, a little bit about this too, but um, the, the number of the entire West Coast trawl fleet is so much smaller now, and they're 100% accountable because they have the observers on the boat all the time. And so the effect has been that it's become a lot cleaner fishery, and the boats that have remained in the fishery are actually doing quite well. They're able to access some grounds and some some uh, fish that they haven't been able to access before, and they're doing quite well. So um, I would say, it, from my perspective, the, the bright spot on the West Coast really right now is ground fish. Um, you know, we're uh, probably gonna have some restricted salmon seasons for the foreseeable fish future because of the drought and uh, the sea urchins are kind of down. That's kind of my perspective on this. I, I um, do know that the Management Council is doing uh, some really hard work right now to get the non-trawl fishermen out in some of those areas and access to more of these um, midwater rockfish abundant stocks. So um, I kind of um, I have some some hope for the future of the fishery, especially the rockfish fishery. Great. Thanks a lot, Dan. Scott, a couple highlights of the harbor, the history of fishing community or the current current situation, something you want to share with folks? I want to reiterate what Anna was talking about. We need a fuel dock. We need help with the ice plant. I manage the ice plant, but it's like it's on a shoestring. You know, I mean, there's not enough. Dan just said when the, when the trawl sector went out, we lost, you know, at least two thirds of what was the backbone of the ice facility and the fuel facility went out of this right before then. And uh, like, we need that stuff. Like we, we need it, or we might as well just put a cement barricade across the harbor and call it a day. Cause there's gonna, it's, it's, there's nothing left. So we, we need that stuff and we need, you know, grant funding or whatever to, to, to help it. I mean, it's, it's not gonna stay open. Those are pretty fundamental elements of making yeah. of I mean, making I mean, fisheries I mean, work. Yeah. I mean, I took I took a boat check out of my personal boat account last year to put the free on in the 
the nice machine to keep it going so the whole fleet can go. And I, I'm not gonna, I can't continue to do it. But I mean, we need help, so. And the, you know, that, that sustainability plan that, that the Harbor District did is good, it's the start. So we just need to push it down the road to get it moving. Yeah, right, right. Putting ideas into action. Yeah, yeah. And Dan's correct that the, we, we bought into the trawl fishery I swore I'd never get back involved. I did it when I was 19, but it was a different, it was a different bird that it was, it was, you know, not clean. I mean, we were hundred percent accountable for everything that we catch. If we don't have it, we don't go fishing. If we don't have it in our account. We're, we're not, we don't untie from the, from the dock. And one way or another, we utilize every, everything that we catch. I mean, everything's, most of it's trucked out of here, but we still, we, you know, our restaurant, comes right up the boat and we fillet and it goes into our restaurant. It goes into some of these other local restaurants that what we, you know, if we catch over it, it goes into the Bay area to our other customers, but it's a clean fishery now, if you, which it never was. So. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that. It gives a little bit more of a sense of the, of the way things are working around here for the fishing community and the fishermen, Bob. Yeah. The, um, what Anoyo uh, Harbor fisheries, is for me, you know, when what I kind of invested into was where every day, you know, a set of boats, they go out and they, they go to the ocean and they bring something back. And I, I was um, able to take like, for example, sea urchin, which was the backbone of my business. I could take that urchin, crack it, clean it, pack it, grate it, have it ready for a sushi bar the next day or two or three. And I could buy enormous amounts of sea urchin, refrigerate them in the plant, um, be totally uh, responsible for all aspects of getting that, that urchin to the market. And um, when the kelp died, um, you know, the, the divers started dwindling away because the, well, the kelp fed the urchin and, and that's what made the meat inside the urchin good, the uni. And without the uni, then the money went away. And a little by little, um, divers had to access deeper waters to bring the better uni. And most of the divers opted to not do that because of the dangers involved. And so um, the fishery has dwindled down to a really small, small trickle at this point. And um, so the opportunities in that area are not so big. The, the bigger opportunities are what Grant's doing over here because there's uh, been a lot of uh, this build back better money or wh wherever, you know, that, that, that printing press money that um, is funding things <laughs> that are creating their own little economies. How, how long that'll last, I don't know. But um, I was able to, you know, start from scratch and go 30 years and employed at one time up to 130 people processing urchins and it was a it was a really um, a really beautiful thing to see so many people involved and everybody getting a paycheck and and people kind of ordering their lives around around the business that you were doing it on in my facility and so most of that's gone away there's just a small handful of people that may might say they make a little money you know there now but um Another part of our, our, the business that I see is, is handling the fleet when it shows up, being able, like when boats come here to, to salmon fish, salmon fishing is kind of very opportunistic and depends on how the regulators decide where you can fish or how much fish they're gonna let you catch. And then that, um, by once they set those rules, then the boats decide whether they're going to come here and fish or not. So uh, a lot of that is just up to the whim of, of the fishermen and what they think is the, where, where they think is the best place to be. And lately, Fort Bragg hasn't been that place for, for salmon. It used to be the biggest salmon port in the whole state. But, but now it's, you know, I watched it go from that to where it is now. And, um, so, you know, we, we take what we can get. We had a couple really good weeks um, last year. We had some boats show up and we filled a few semi trucks with salmon and, you know, it was, that was kind of fun, but it only kept three or four people busy. You know, it, it's not a very labor intensive type 
type business. And it's not why I have a 15,000 square foot building in the harbor. Right. You know, I mean, I, I have a, all this space that was um, used to fillet, you know, fish fillet house. And then, then I became an urchin processing place. But um, as far as opportunities go, um, the new opportunities I see are outside companies. Like uh, I know Anna said that they want to attract more companies, more buyers. Usually that's what I am right now. And usually you don't want more competition, right? The fishermen want more buyers, but processors and, and fish buyers don't necessarily want more buyers, right? That's usually how it goes. But um, I'm seeing right now that, um, you know, outside buyers may have different expectations from our fisheries that are different than the ones I have. And they have a big monster to feed or, or other, other ideas that um, they're willing to send trucks to get because they're getting more money on the other side for the products. And so um, there may be some connections and opportunities in that, but um, mostly uh, most of the fisheries that I'm involved in now, I, I would classify them as boutique, you know, that are small, um, not much volume to them. I, I, I have a place that really thrives on volume because I, you can back a truck up and drive a forklift in the truck and load it quick and get it out. And at one time that was a really valuable thing and it's not so much now, but, um, you know, we, we, in, in the, in the, as a fish buyer down there, you, you've seen cycles of the fisheries and the way they've, they've been really low and not much going on. And then all of a sudden, boom, they come back and you might get a good three, four years. Sometimes I've seen it and you, we keep hanging on to the hope that we're going to see that again. <laughs> and that, that keeps a lot of us still involved and, and um, you know, expecting, but yeah, how long you can do that for is, is kind of the big question. So. Thanks for that. Kevin. Well, I've been involved, like I said, it, as Scott mentioned, our number one thing we do need here is, is the infrastructure. You know, as Bob mentioned, we're all in hopes that, you know, we'll continue to have cycles up and down in industry and that's why we put in the hours that we do i have an unfortunate thing that i have a partner that doesn't say no <laughs> so we look at each other many after many decisions and ask ourselves why um, as we put in the hours but the the infrastructure is obviously the, the key uh, scott it, it does have a lot of times that where it's middle of the night middle of the morning boats to go the ice machines down and without ice as you all know it's like you're not having a refrigerator at home uh, our industry can't you know, succeed without it. Um, the and of course the fuel dock is very important. And you know, we took on a boat which was actually built, which is a, a, a trawl boat here, was the Blue Pacific that was built here in Fort Bragg in 1963, right across the river from our restaurant location. And Scott and I saw the important thing was always, of course, taking care of your employee and making sure that they had sustainable work and hours. You know, in the industry, and that's what you know, how the restaurant was born. We were trying to figure out ways of what we could do to uh, keep it working throughout the year and not have to shut down, you know, on the slower cycles. So we opened that, which now that we have the, the Blue Pacific, we actually are able to produce our own fish for that. Um, the other thing I do, which I've been involved with for a number of years, is I also have a uh, US Coast Guard license. They call 100 ton master. So I run a charter boat. And we recently just moved the uh, charter boat, the Viking, which was redone over to Anna's outside her office door over on a dock. So we were watched very well, but we're going to be running our charters now out of that side of the Harbor and hope to increase uh, Harbor activity and use and productivity from the Harbor itself over there. And, uh, Going forth to the fisheries, um, as was Dan was mentioned, both from the commercial side and the, the sport angler side, Fort Bragg offers a lot in the sense that there are a lot of close grounds. So people have the ability to come out and go fishing and a lot of near shore fishing so they can see the beautiful north coast that we have from the lost coast to down towards off of Mendocino. And uh, we look forward to always people coming up for that and enjoying the other uh, important things around the community. Thanks very much. Grant. 
Um, you know, I can really start this out by saying, you know, myself sitting here on this panel with Bob, I mean, it's full circle. So my father left San Diego and came up here before I was ever even an idea. And it was chasing the urchin industry. So a Volkswagen van and all his dive gear and the industry kept him going. And that's why I'm here today. So for me, four brag fisheries are the urchin industry being underwater and the kelp forest. I, apologies if I have to read off of here. I've, I've done so many interviews, I, I find myself in tangents. So <laughs> I'm have to reference some of it, but uh, I mean, Baum mentioned some of it. When the kelp forests collapsed in 2014, uh, the bull kelp disappeared and it hasn't made a comeback yet. And the sea urchins depend on healthy kelp forests to have viable uni inside. Otherwise you're just picking shells for compost. So after the kelp disappeared, the urchin industry almost collapsed. Uh, 30 to what, 40 divers is now maybe 10. Uh, I, plant workers, there were probably 100 plant workers, multiple shifts, and now it's, you know, Bob and the other owner of the other plant and a handful of guys. It's, it's hardly going anymore. Um, so like I had mentioned, the last four years of my involvement in the fisheries here is working on projects for kelp restoration. I've been working with the Noyo Center ongoing and the Nature Conservancy, uh, the Greater Fairlawns Association and Reef Check California. Um, I'm just, I'm trying to do my part because I don't want to see another industry collapse. Uh, Growing up and going through school here, I mean, I, I can almost remember the last time I heard the mill bell ring in the middle of the day. And I'm, we don't even have a working lumber mill here. Uh, fishing can't be the next industry to die. So my focus is, you know, keeping the urchin industry that we have going, uh, trying to build a local market for sea urchins. It's, it's not really a seafood that, you know, people seek out like fish or other mm -hmm. crab things like that and you know i want to work to get the reefs back to how they should have been um with a healthy kelp forest the amount of animals that strive on it i mean our communities lost our recreational abalone fishery and that brought the biggest influx of tourists and visitors and money into the community and we haven't had that in years and it's all because the kelp's gone so i mean tearjerker but you know being a dad myself and me growing up and enjoying the ocean and being on the boat and seeing everything and getting abalone you know I have kids and I want them to be able to enjoy it and not just see the harbor as you know recreational fishing or a collapse you know we've got to do something to work to bring it back Well said, thank you. Thanks to all of you for your thoughts on that one. So we're gonna move on here to our second question for y'all, which is um, related to the working waterfront. And so as we heard earlier, you know, there's this dire need for ice, for fuel. Um, what are some of the opportunities and challenges in addition to those already mentioned that you see here facing um, Fort Bragg and Noyo Harbor fisheries. So challenges and opportunities. Do you want to go in reverse order now? All right, we'll switch it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, unfortunately, I wasn't here earlier to hear Anna's speech. I bet it was great. She's great. Um, I was actually trying to harvest some merchants for the fishermen's market this weekend. So let's hope that works out. Um, but just personally, I've had my boat moored in the Noro Harbor District for about 12 years now. Uh, the biggest issue I see is just usability. So fuel dock is an issue. Um, it doesn't affect me as much because I'm smaller and trailerable, but a lot of the big boats that are bringing in the majority of the catch, they can't even make it to Dolphin Isle. And I know the fuel trucks got cracked down on a little bit about pumping fuel in the river and enviro issues. So having a, you know, a public fuel dock that's accessible to everybody, that's a huge one. Um, ice wise, you know, I utilize it when I'm going to albacore fishing and that's, you know, one of the funnest things to do. But as an urchin diver, I don't utilize the ice as much. 
but we have to have it for the rest of the fisheries. Uh, you can't keep your catch fresh without ice. So launching a boat in the harbor, there's two really nice ramps. There's a front ramp and a back ramp and you drive to your dock and then to go back to your truck and trailer, you're walking in the street. There's no sidewalks in the harbor. Uh, even if somebody wants to go down and walk and look at all the boats, it's, it's not as safe as going on the coastal trail or something like that. So if we could bring in, you know, sidewalks, better streets, maybe even remodel the seawall and put a, you know, a walking viewing area there. I mean, that's what the other harbors have. If you go to other areas, it's, it's user friendly. So docks the docks that i'm on are original i'm guessing <laughs> uh, boards are always being fixed screws are always loose it always seems like an issue uh, the docks that got replaced after the tsunami are amazing I, i'd i'd love to be able to keep my boat there uh, but i'm happy with what i have so uh, the bigger one is you know not everybody in this world is honest so a while back we got gates at the top of the lock at the top of the docks and they have combination locks on them uh, it's probably cut down on theft and things like that um, however it's really easy for me to just tell him a combination and then everybody has it so if we could switch that to a key card everybody has a key card it's going to keep a lot more people out um, i know the harbor district's always battling people vandalizing and stealing and all sorts of things I don't want to mention in the bathrooms. Um, key card the bathrooms, key card the shower. If you want to use it, you know, pay to use it. If we want to, if we want to, if we want to think, keep things nice, we have to protect them. And I mean, that's how things are these days. Uh, the last one is kind of a newer issue that we're facing, and it's doing repairs or mechanics or anything on my vessel in the harbor. Um, it's frowned upon to do at the dock and in the water and with the revamp of the front parking lot, uh, they don't want oil spills or anything in there. So if we could expand or make our shipyard in the harbor bigger and more usable, I think that would really benefit, you know, the fishermen that are still trying to utilize our harbor as a working harbor. I agree with most of the points that uh, Grant made as far as the harbor and the infrastructure, which I think is probably the most important uh, session that was had before this one. Um, so that, that of course, needs to come first. Uh, sidewalks would be great, but obviously without, without fuel and without ice, we won't have to worry about a lot of boats being in the harbor for people to come and view or fisheries or the fish, you know, fish markets that we're starting to have and stuff of actually selling the, uh, the catch and stuff there. So that would be uh, obviously number one. And as far as the uh, other parts of it, I mean, they just uh, established the, like I said, the ADOC, which is uh, where they're gonna put some of the charter boats to try to diversify a little bit of the traffic during the summers uh, and you know, locate those over on that. And that's where the first boat over there. And then uh, Anna's working with some other uh, charter operators and stuff to bring more over to that side and enhance that part of the, uh, the harbor and the, and the town. Great, thank you. And would love to also, you know, certainly don't wanna be Pollyanna here, but also to hear thoughts about um, opportunities as well as some of the challenges, which you've started to hit on, but. The opportunities are, are harder to find, but <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I really, I hate to say that, but, um, you know, where um, for me, you know, the uh, the working waterfront really doesn't, uh, and everything that I have, I have uh, you know, building and trucks, and well, I have a truck. Uh, California took three of them away from me. <laughs> Regulations, all, all that stuff. But so, so there's all these things you have to invest in in order to have the working waterfront, because. Just to, if a fisherman comes in and only one fisherman comes in with 100 pounds of fish, if I can't sell it here in Fort Bragg, I got to send a truck to San Francisco. And the cost to send a truck to San Francisco now with fuel and everything is at least almost $1,000, you know, to pay somebody to go. So 
the the economics of the trucking determine a lot about what are you going to do with the product when you get it depends on how much you get so economies of scale are a really big thing right now um there are opportunities for guys like scott and uh, you know we can collaborate a little bit and and carpool if you will and and you know work together closer with with other competing companies um it makes a lot of sense a lot more so now nowadays and we've been doing that you know on and off for years but um but having boats leave the harbor go out and bring something back is is that's the opportunity that, that i'm waiting for okay that's the opportunity that i'm expecting now if we if that's not happening it's either because i'm not paying enough money to, for the products, which I think I am, or I don't have enough people willing to go out and get the products. And, and there's, there's a big shortage of those, those types. There, there are a few, you know, there's some, the people that are doing it right now are, I would say, very dedicated to what they're doing. You know, they're, they're, they're really making a go of it, but there aren't enough of those people to support all the businesses down there to where we can say we're really, you know, doing well. And, and so economies of scale is a really big thing here. And that can only be um, improved by um, creating more access to the fisheries, you know, through um, the, Sierra, the California Commission. You know, they have, they pull the strings on a lot of those things and getting rules changed and all that, you know, it, it's, it's a whole thing, <laughs> but, um, but there are the opportunities I, I think are, uh, that I'm seeing come up in on North Harbor drive or is a lot of the tourism that's happening. You know, people are, are flocking to the Harbor. They, they want to eat Scott's fish and chips. He's, he's got the best fish and chips. <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> You know, because he, they come right off his boat. That's what people expect when you come to a fishing village, right? You want, you want to have local fish caught, you know. People think oysters are coming out of ocean here. I go, no, no, they come from uh, uh, Humboldt Bay, but it's, that's almost local. You know, you don't have to lie about that one, right? But, but uh, you, know, uh, you know, in order to have fresh fish at Princess Seafood, you got to have a steady stream of people bringing something to the dock. And that is key. That is, and if you were not seeing enough of that, then, then you got to say why. See? And, and so, I mean, I'm sitting there waiting and I know why, but you know, I can't change that because I, I'm not going to go buy my own urchin boat and like Scott, he's vertically integrated. He has his own boats uh market restaurant everything you know so he he's got them all covered i i bought my own ice machine so some people stress about ice but i don't stress about ice because i can make a whole tote of ice every hour so um i can you know i'm a little bit self-sufficient in that area so some problems that other people might worry about i i'm not worrying about i'm just worried about boats bringing me product that's that's my biggest challenge Excellent. Really helpful. I'll touch on what Bob was just talking about. So the, the state, the federal government has essentially locked all entry level positions out of the fishing, unless you have a bunch of money or a bunch of, you know, whatever you have no, you have no entry levels. Well, he's Bob's waiting for boats to come in, right? Well, there's no boats left. There's no, there's, there's some handful of permits. All the, the, the people are left, you know, the grants young, but there's no, how many, how many guys are left that are, that are actively diving? Most of them are like, they're, they're not even able to dive anymore, but those permits are not active, right? How can Bob get any sea urchin when there's no permits left? Yeah. We, you're going to be waiting a while. I mean, yeah, you're yeah. Gonna be waiting. Yeah. I mean and it's, it's not just that fishery. That's why we, we had to integrate or we were going to be out. I mean, it was just, it just doesn't work. I mean, we bought our own boats and I, I didn't want to be in the fish business. I'd rather go back fishing. I like fishing. I don't like being in the business. I don't like it at all, but we, we wouldn't make it otherwise. So I don't know how you can turn that table, but Dan, Dan, Dan's tried for many, many years. And I mean, he, he can touch on that, but we've, we've just locked, you know, 
the younger generation out of this. And it's and it's now you know you took a public resource and then privatized it by putting a price tag on it. My that's my view. Limited entry program. Got it. Dan. Yeah, I guess so. Since Scott mentioned it, I'll. Uh, one of my things that I've been fighting for on the council level, this is the management level, is to get the uh, the small boat fishermen, the open access fishermen. Open access refers to the fishermen that are targeting fish that they don't need a permit for. There's, there's very few of those. Um, very few fisheries that are open access left, but there is, um, could be some opportunity in those fisheries for especially the smaller boats to, uh, to get out there. And um, we've been, uh, when, back when there was a ground fish disaster, one of the things that the management council did was they closed a huge part of the ocean and they called it the rockfish conservation area. And um, the trawlers uh, within the last three or four years have actually been able to access that closed area and, and they're starting to be able to access some of those um, fish that are abundant and, and we haven't been able to access because they've been in that closed area. So as a hook line fishery representative, I've been fighting to get the hook and line fishermen back out there. And it's been a little tougher for us because, uh, you know, we have a variety of different sizes of boats and um, it's also uh, the, the open access fishery tends to be more of a low volume, high price fishery. Um, so your average open access fisherman can't afford to pay for an observer. And um, because the uh, trawl fishery is 100% observed, they're considered more accountable because they, they know what they're doing out there and what they're catching. But anyways, um, it looks like, uh, got to keep our fingers crossed, but it looks like um, the National Marine Fisheries Service and the council are finally hearing, uh, you know, our need to get out there in the RCA and, and starting January 2023, I'm pretty confident that that those areas will be opened. And um, again, it's, I don't know how much it'll help Bob, but uh, um, it's, we're, we're talking about probably more low volume, uh, high price type of fisheries. Uh, um, one of the things that I did this last year was I bought the permit so I can sell um, fish off my boat directly to the public. And I've been doing that mostly with uh, the lingcod that I catch. Mm -hmm. And I'm discovering that there's a large demand um, Yum. especially here in Fort Bragg, uh, um, the local people are, are really tuned in to that. And, um, some of the ports south of us, um, like uh, Halfman Bay, have really developed that off the boat sales type of fisheries. It tends to be uh, kind of a small boat fishery, but uh, and it doesn't help the buyers out any, but uh, it, it is getting fish, fresh fish to the public. And um, I think it's important for us to do that so that the American public can learn to eat fish. Uh, because in, in the past, uh, about 80% of our fish has been exported to other countries and we need to get our domestic market going fish. Uh, there's a big difference between uh, fresh fish that Scott's boat brings in and they serve at their restaurant, uh, fresh fish that I catch and, and uh, sell off my boat directly to the public and the fish that you go and buy in a store. I think if people start to have access to that fish, 
and they'll realize how good it is. Great. Any, yeah, I was just going to ask any other inspiration strike while you were listening, please. So one opportunity that the Noyo Harbor offers is a place for me to moor my vessel, um, a dock to walk down, a parking lot to park in. So not everything is bad. I, you know, without that, it would be a trailer launch situation every day. And that's just, that's just going to make my day two hours longer. So, and then data wise, cause everybody likes data. What Bob touched on. So the California sea urchin permit is a closed access fishery uh, and permits are only let out under a lottery system and age wise there are only 22 permits for under the age of 40 in the state. So majority of every urchin permit is being held on to by non-active divers, hoping that, I don't know, not being transferable, it's not something you can sell off as another permit, so. Yeah, once more hearing a lot about the limited entry permits being a challenge. Somebody over here want to say something else? I'm sensing. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like me to, if you're if you're done with that one, shall we move on? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you want to give this one? Sure. Thanks. You all have touched on so many different aspects of what it takes to make fisheries, fishing communities, and harbors work. Again, appreciating Anna's lead in too. Um, and we're hearing a little bit about it. Um, hearing an inkling of some opportunities and you know there's all this hubbub around blue economy and developing the blue economy but fisheries here at fort bragg are really in a sense a cornerstone or maybe even the cornerstone of the blue economy that's what it's been for a long time um and and some related activities so as you think about that and you think about the future and a little bit of what you've heard so far and other things that you hear out in the community and so on Think about it like a vibrant blue economy, and I'm sorry that sounds very jargony or pie in the sky. But you know, what does a, a healthy, thriving blue economy with fisheries here in Fort Bragg really look like? And how do you get there? Uh, and you know, do you do it just as fishermen and fish buyers and processors and seafood handlers and so on working together, or do you branch out more? Are there other partners? Obviously, it sounds like the port is a partner. Um, and anyway, so if you can reflect on that, and anybody who wants to speak up, and it's, sorry not to keep going like back and forth and make us all dizzy, but if anybody has any thoughts on that. So visions for a vibrant blue economy and the role of fisheries in it and, and how you get there. Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, I think one of the, Hearing that presentation in San Diego, you know, with all everything going on down there, that's a little bit overwhelming. I mean, I couldn't picture very much of that happening here. But that water system uh, that the other uh, woman was talking about, um, if we had something like that, that would open up a lot, you know. But getting there is, you know, a big question mark of what it would take. And, and what what about opening that up? appeals to you what well, you think the, well oh, for okay the, we have this problem with these purple sea urchin you know and eating the kelp because there's um the most of you might might have heard about the the reason why we don't have very much kelp was created by some warm water back in 2014 and for 15 14 and 15 and um ever since then whatever happened roasted the bottom and kelp never came back well Grant's working on kelp restoration. Um, there's money been appropriated for that. And the idea is that it, it, these purple urchin, kind of their population exploded during this warm water event. And there's so many of them on the bottom that they're like, um, like if you could picture a, a field being eaten by locusts, right? That's what it is with these these purple urchins. They, they just mow down the, the kelp almost as fast as it grows. That's why you don't see any kelp beds anymore. And so um, if there was a way that uh, people could go out and collect uh, these purple urchins 
and I'm hoping that the people don't have to be licensed urchin divers because they don't want to, uh, most of them don't want to dive right now as it is, but you're taking a low value product and then bringing it to a system where you have water and then you can create an aquaculture place where you're feeding these urchins because there's already, we probably heard from urch, urchinomics, right? Mm -hmm. And these other companies that are experimenting and doing these things in other parts of the, of the planet. Uh, there are ways to, you know, that is a, a, a reachable thing maybe for us. Mm -hmm. I can see that with with that with that and and experience. being able to get people to go out and collect urchins, not on a big scale, but kind of like mushroom pickers go out into the forest and get mushrooms. There's a whole community around here that does that, and they'll walk around all day in the forest for for fifty to a hundred dollars, you know, or less. And so I think that there there are opportunities in the urchin realm. If it could ever be created, you know, the, the, the infrastructure to uh, have a place for, to bring them, to feed them, and ultimately to s process them or sell them whole, whichever way works better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but we're way far, we're way off from that. And, and I don't see that happen in the next two or three years. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not going to make it vibrant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or the blue economy is not going to be booming because of that. So, uh, but that's something that that does look um, like it has a little potential. You right. know, that's to me. great. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Maybe less large government and smaller industry control of what actually happens in the fisheries. Mm -hmm. The actual fishermen that, you know, Bob being the senior to Scott. But, the two of them with the amount of processing and stuff and the fisheries that their knowledge they've had at Fort Bragg here is that, that a lot of times the, the regulations that come down come down with sometimes it seems like to the fishing community and even the public without some common sense involved in it mm -hmm. and there are closures that are put out um, that restrict areas that really didn't even have to be restricted and we're facing another potential one this next year with the closures of a lot of areas due to the uh, pullback in the copper and we Cop haven't even had fish. the studies yet and we welcome observers to get on and get some actual you know real data to to con you know to go on where right now we're getting stuff that when we've seen it and dan seen it scott and bob they you know stopped the canary and you couldn't go out on a charter boat and not catch a canary and i kept telling you, you know you've got to let that fish go and you're going but why it's because well they're they're protected they're, they're there's not many of them and it's well, why are we catching all of them well it turned out that the canary population was very strong and now it's non-limited as far as the sport catch goes so i think if we go back to uh you know the the, the actual accountability and stuff from the, the the fishermen the processors and those and and you know be it the game warden that that sees it and less coming out of the larger government offices control it Thank you. Their visions for a vibrant blue economy and how to get there. That uh, presentation that they made about the intake and outfall and all that, that's, if they can get it more power to them, that's great. I mean, I think, I, I think any industry or of any kind is, is welcome in my opinion. I know that not all this community shares that, but if there's jobs being created, let's do it. That's, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of land out there they could do a lot of things, whether sea urchins, sabalones, whatever they choose. I don't know. But I mean, I'd be down for that. I've always enjoyed like, you know, aquaculture and, and every part of it. So, I mean, this, I think that's a long ways down the road with, with uh, permitting and, and, but if they can get it, do it. I mean, it's, that's uh that's vacant land that needs, that needs something there. It's, it's long overdue. That should have been developed a long time ago. Can you can you envision the fishing community participating in in helping to make that happen? I would like to, I would like to. I mean, I, and I know that I could push a lot of people to to do that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Grant, do you have something you'd like to add? Sort of thinking about visions for the future, and I have to say, it starts with community engagement with the commercial fishing industry. Um, Anna and the Harbor District starting the Fisherman's Farmer's Market to start. 
but it should be all the way down to direct from the processor. I mean, if they don't have enough to take to the city, there needs to be a public way or an announcement board or something where somebody that's trying to seek out seafood doesn't have to get it from Harvest or Safeway. They can get it directly from them. I mean, they have an excess of fish. Why wait for a one month fisherman's market when they're here all the time? Um, I mean, this board could also have information on it on off the dock sales, uh, contact info for Dan. He's going to have Ling Cod Friday, you know, things like that. Um, it could benefit Kevin. Let's, let's have some recreational sport clubs, fishing derbies. You know, if I show up and I see somebody got like a 50 pound salmon, I'm going to be trolling until I get like a 52, <laughs> <laughs> you know, things like that. Um, aquaculture wise, uh, I have worked with Urchinomics and I was part of the harvester for the initial trials in Bodega Bay. Um, I think it is a great opportunity, but I don't know if it's the complete answer. Um, of all the purple urchins that are out there and the population boom, I'd say at a high number, only about 20% of them are of a ranchable size. So yeah, you're gonna be able to pull out however many to be ranched. Um, then you're gonna have to ranch them for nine weeks with California prices and hopefully sell them at a reasonable price for the consumer. Um, I would much rather see aquaculture be pushed towards growing kelp, growing food. Um, let's get bull kelp going and let's outplant bull kelp. Um, it, bull kelp drops spores from the fronds when it's reproductive. So let's just overspore the environment on our own. Let's help out the system. Uh, everything that's growing naturally, you know, is getting eaten. And I've, you know, I've been seeing that when I'm underwater. So let's just, let's just push, you know, push the ecosystem full of food. Let's outplant, let's spore, drop, anything we can do. Great, thank you. All right, Dan, visions for the future and the fisheries and the blue economy. Well, one of the things that Bob and a couple of the other speakers kind of touched on was the commercial fishermen and recreational fishermen seems like we're constantly getting bombarded by regulations from this or regulations from that. Uh, um, currently, um, our current administration is pushing uh, wind farms on the ocean. And um, the Council and a lot of the fishermen have been involved in, uh, you know, saying you, you can't just put them anywhere. You, some of the places they're um, planning on putting these things are right in our most productive fishing grounds. And, and they've told us that, you know, you, you're not allowed to even fish near them. You have to be, uh, you know, two miles away from them when you're fishing. Um, on the Dungeness crab has been kind of the bread and butter of the um, coast since uh, the, for the last few years. And uh, this year, the, the season got shut down early because of uh, a couple of reports of whales getting entangled in crab lines. And, you know, I'm all about saving the whales, but uh, some of the uh, commercial crab fishermen really depend on that late season, which they didn't have this year, you know, so I, I think uh, getting the people that make these decisions to really understand both the implications of their decisions, but also to, to get in touch with the fishing communities and, and to really understand more what's going on, you know, Grant with his knowledge about the sea urchins and um, is is really important. Uh, we get, need to probably reach out to our our legislators and stuff like that, you know, and try to get some more communication between the the people that are on the water and and see what's going on and the people that are making the decisions. Thank you. That's really helpful too. So we have a few more minutes. We're, we're done barraging you with questions, I think. Is there 
Anything though you'd like to add to what you've said or any questions to put out to others? And at the same time, we will be inviting the audience to ask questions as well. Yeah. Yeah. Any further thoughts or questions to anyone or anything like that? I just want to push. We need fuel and ice to keep this <laughs> to keep to keep this port alive. We need it. Yeah. yeah. Pretty Find basic. Us some money. Pretty basic. <laughs> and a hand. Yeah. The, I, also, usually what comes along with the fuel dock is the other types of things, you know, uh, oil to change your oil with, filters, fuel filters and stuff like that. So um, we need not just the fuel dock, but we don't currently have a marine store in the harbor. And so we have to, uh, you know, drive up to Eureka or, or send, send up to Eureka to to get our fishing gear and it's uh, all those conveniences that we had when the trawl fleet was active that have gone away. We really need to get that stuff to come back. Thanks for adding that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I, I would say, you know, the marine store, the ice and the, the fuel and all that is it all, before we get that, we need to have access to the fish, yeah. right? I mean, that's that has to be the first thing. Otherwise, that's why those other things have gone away because we we've been losing yeah. that. Yeah. So um, yeah. that's the, the real key part. And and what what really chaps me sometimes is, you know, they make these regulations like like they, they put a marine protected area. And when you hear about that, you think, oh, what a wonderful thing. We're going to protect the marine environment. And well, what you did is you put a fence up and you are not allowing the divers to harvest in that area anymore. So now we have even a worse urchin barren than we had before. And now we, which we all agree that urchin barrens are bad because they mow down the kelp, right? So, so we kind of, with some, sometimes you create a problem, you know, with thinking we're doing something good. And, and once it's done, it, it's really hard to undo. So um, a lot of these regulations go that way. So uh, I,